makes me mad to see what men shall do and we in our graves says Robert Browning it was indeed in the heydays of renaissance that the human spirit was discovered at the center of multifarious possibilities from the theocentric worldview of antiquity men suddenly found the entire world revolving around him his infrying ambitions inspired him to soar higher and higher in search of infrying glory, whereas the bestial components in him often pushed him towards the forbidden darkness of its own psyche. Hence, human mind well up with volley of colorful emotions. In this program of ours, we are presenting very significant monologues or soliloquies from the tragedies of William Shakespeare that showcases the spontaneous overflow of powerful human emotion. In 1599, Shakespeare wrote the tragedy of Julius Caesar. It is not only a play that projects Caesar's life and his rule. Rather, this dramatic work of remarkable dexterity lays bare what happened after the assassination of Caesar. What happened when a country's orphan following the sudden death of its ruler? And what happens when a devoted friend is compelled to act against his own dear friend for the sake of the nation? Julius Caesar is a five-act play. In the first scene of the third act, Caesar is stabbed to death by antagonizing Senate members, namely Decius. Ligarius, Casca, and Brutus. Caesar is too shocked at the abrupt execution of the conspiracy and recognizing Brutus, his dearest admirer among the assassinators, cannot help express it to Brut. His death causes tremendous lawlessness in Rome. Mark Antony another reputed member of the Senate, who has been removed from the Senate room timely, can hardly expect the cause of the nation which was upheld to justify Caesar's assassination. Being a devout friend to Caesar, he takes his body to the forum and delivers a funeral speech to the public. Friends, Romans, countrymen, Lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar. Not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus, I told you, Caesar was ambitious. Did it well so? It was a grievous fall. And grievously, that Caesar answered it. Then under leave of Brutus and the rest. For Brutus is an honorable man. So are they all, all honorable men. Come I. To speak in Caesar's field. He was my friend. Faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms to the general coffers will. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When did the poor have cried Caesar had wept? Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. You are dead, see on the lubricant. I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. 
Was this ambition? Yet Buddha says he was ambitious. And sure, he is an honorable man. I speak not to be true what Buddha spoke. But here I have to speak what I do know. You all did love him once on without cause. What cause withholds even more for him? Oh, judgment though are fled to British beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me, my heart is in the coffin there with Caesar. And I must pause till it come back to me. Shakespeare was intrigued to witness this changing world order in the Elizabethan period, recalls the regicide in the chronicles often made him suspicious of the conspiracies looming as the backdrop of the dethronements and coronation of various rulers of considerable repute. On the other hand, he conjectured indecision to be one of the fatal reasons to lead a rational being towards lunacy, and it, if caused in a prince owing to his intolerable knowledge, of the foul play his own father has been subjected to, problematizes the erstwhile viable idea of kingship. Hence, Shakespeare took his materials from a popular Norse legend and wrote the tragedy of Hamlet. Hamlet, the prince of Denmark, receives the shocking news of his father's death while he was studying in the University of Wittenberg. Strangely enough, the sad news was accompanied with an welcome invitation to celebrate the marriage of his mother, Kachud, with Clergius, his own uncle, appalled by the abruptness of two shocks. Hamlet returns to his motherlands with his Boshan friend, Horatio, and is supposedly haunted by the ghost of his dead father, who urges him to avenge his death. Hamlet is torn between the do's and do not of his life and cannot help outpouring his mind in one of the greatest soliloquies of all time. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing end them. To die, to sleep no more. And by your sleep, to say, we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come? When we have shuffled up this mortal coil, must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would be the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong. The proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the lost lay to grunt and sweat under a very life. But that, the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns, bottles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have that fly to others that we know not of. Thus, consents does make cowards of us all and lose the name of faction. Shakespeare used the existing chronicles and folk tales as a source of his tragedies. Tales from Italy had much attraction for him. Beside the post-cultural mixing in Renaissance Italy, as a direct result of the flourishing sea trade, raised a series of questions in his mind, just like the predicament of Shylock, a Jew inhabited predominatingly by Christians. He was triggered to realize the plight of a Moor, a person of black ethnicity, if audited among the white Italian aristocracy, is Otilio is a product of such an imperial quest. As the tale goes, Desdemona the exquisitely beautiful and
and simple hearted daughter of Brabantio, a rich senator of Venice, falls in love with Othello, a valiant Moorish general of black ethnicity. They get married against Brabantio's will. Othello's dearest friend, Cassio, who is a native Italian, is raised to the post of a lieutenant. Both of these are reasons enough to cause vicious anger in Iago, a middle-aged Italian of royal connection, who has always been hateful to Othello. He plots a vile conspiracy, as a result of which Othello grows menacingly jealous of Cassio and starts considering her beloved wife Desdemona to be infidel. Iago's time instigations add insult to the injury and finally Othello enters Desdemona's bed chamber to murder her. It is the cause. It is the cause, my soul. Let me not name it to you. You just stars. It is the cause. Yet, I will not shed her blood, nor scar that whiter skin of hers than snow and smooth as monumental alabaster. James the first once again prioritized the perennial question who is fit to rule besides Machiavelli the great political thinker has also asserted that a true noble man namely a prince take up any means fair or foul for serving his own goal that is to encroach the ruling power. At this juncture, Shakespeare was astonished to see the immense capability and virtuosity with which the noble man ruled. Yet their proneness to darker aspects of the soul often caused their own ruin, problematizing the very idea of kingship. In tragedy of Macbeth, the bird has thus delved deep into the psyche of the post-Renaissance individual who can go any farther for achieving his own mission, that is, the infirm glory. While returning victorious from a battle, Macbeth, the valiant thane of Glamis, encounters three witches who assured him that 
he would be the king of Scotland. Macbeth considers these prophecies are inevitable and be charged with his own wartime ambition and instigated by her friend like wife Lady Macbeth. He is about to murder Duncan, the present King of Scotland, who was resting in his own castle. On his way to murder the old king, who is his own uncle, Macbeth is stunned to see a dagger hanging in the air before him. Is this a dagger which you see before me? The handle toward my hand. Come, let me clutch it. I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. Art thou not a fatal vision, sensible to feeling as to sight? Or art thou but a dagger of the mind? Huh? A false creation proceeding from the heat of breast brain. I see thee yet, in form as palpable as this, which now I draw. Thou marshalest me the way that I was going, and such an instrument I was to use. My eyes are made fools of the other senses. Or else, or else, worth all the rest. And on thy dudgeon and blood, there are gouts of blood, which was, which was not so before. I say, I said, this is this bloody business. Which it forms thus to mine eyes. <laughs> now, over the one half world, nature seems dead. In wicked dreams abuse the garden sleep. Witchcraft celebrates Bell Hecate's sufferings. And withered mother. Alarmed by his sentinel, the wolf, whose house is watch, does with his stealthy pace, with dark winds, ravishing strides towards his design, moves like a ghost. The sure and firm dart. Hear not my steps, which way they walk, for fear thy very stones spread off my whereabout, and take the current horror from the time which now suits with it. Whilst I threat, he leaves. Words to the heat of deeds, too cold breath gives. I go, and it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan, for it's the knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. Soliloquies are monologues were supposed to be delivered by a character when he was alone on stage, not directed to anybody in particular. These long speeches allow the spectators to have a glance at the dark depths of the soul of the character. Composed long before the emergence of psychology, 
as a specific branch of science. These speeches indeed testify the playwright's keen insight into the subconscious of the thinking individual. And Shakespeare, as a dramatist, has not only touched the zenith of its excellence, but has also shown the way to the subsequent literatures to explore the erected wit and the infected will of the rational individual. Here lies his insuperable credit.